Some of you might know this, some of you might not know this, so I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, Meredith and I have a great opportunity to be on part of the team with KHIS Radio, and it's a Christian radio station on 89.9 FM. And we get a great op- some opportunities sometimes because we have concerts come to town. And we had one this past Friday. We had a, a guy named Corey Asbury. Anybody familiar with this guy? Yeah, a few claps. It's an awesome night of worship, sold out, packed house, amazing night of worship. And it's, it's, there's a picture. There we are backstage with Corey. There's Corey and his wife, Anna, awesome people. Uh, Brody's got his eyes closed, but he was praying. He was praying right there. He was praying. He was in the spirit at that moment. Uh, but yeah, man, we had, we had a blast. Corey, and you get to hang out with Corey and Anna, and just to see the worship that happened that night, it was beautiful. And hearing some of the testimonies from a night like that. But the thing I wanted to share with you all, the, the thing I like the most about the concerts that we get to put on and we get to, we get, we're in the back behind the scenes, you know, making sure things go right for the people that come. Uh, I get to, get to meet a lot of artists and get to talk to them. And they're just regular people that love the Lord. But Corey and Anna were some of the most down-to-earth people that we've ever met. I mean, they were just really, really cool. Most of Friday in the morning, I got to spend a lot of time with Corey and Anna and get to talk to them. We talked life. We talked raising kids. We talked all kinds of stuff. And we get into this topic of this conversation about a specific song that he wrote that's one of my favorites. And we're just talking through the lyric and the scripture and where it came from. And we're just talking about how good God is and the power of his love and that some people just don't know how good God is. And that's, he was like, you know, that, that's why I do what I do. I want to write songs. God's given me this gift to write songs and play music. I just want to make him known. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, God has given me this gift to speak, you know, or whatever it is, how good it is, I don't know. It's, all I know is this. I just get up here and do whatever I think I'm supposed to do every week. I don't know if it's any good. Uh, but I'm trying, I'm trying my best to make him known in everything that we do, right? Right? And, I, and just a side note, I, I, I really honestly hope you guys know this. Like, I, I don't want you to come here because of me. I want you to come here not because of the music, not because of the lights. I want you to come here to hear about Jesus, right? right. And so he's explaining to me this lyric that just rocked my world the first time I heard this song and this bridge of the song. It was just so powerful. I was like, man, that's so good. And he's explaining it to me when he actually wrote it, what he was going through at the time. And then he played that song Friday night, and it meant something completely different to me. In fact, I put it on repeat last night as I was putting the final touches on this message, and it just I would get chills just as I was listening to it. Now, three days ago, if I listened to that song, I liked it. You know, I mean, I didn't dislike it. But, man, when you heard about the why behind it, And here's my point. Knowing the creator explains the creation. And so when you know, like I I got to get get to know Corey Asbury and he explained the heart behind it. Well, then I understood the creation of this song. I understood the song a lot better because I know the guy who actually wrote it. Right? I got to know his heart behind it. And here's the problem that we face as Christians. If you don't know God, you won't know peace in your life. And there's a lot of people today, you're walking around, you call yourself a Christian, but you really don't have any peace in your life. And so you're on this continual search for happiness, and happiness is just a feeling. So it's fleeting. Feelings come in, they go out. I'm happy one day, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy this day. I'm happy because this happened, I'm unhappy because of this happened. See, peace doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't matter what the circumstance is when you have peace. And so peace comes from having peace with God first. And if you have peace with God, then you can have peace with yourself. But if you don't have peace with God, you're not going to have peace with yourself. And if you don't have peace with yourself, you're not going to have peace with other people, right? But it only starts that way. And some people wonder why I can't have peace with people. Well, you don't have peace with God. That's the problem. And here's the, take, take it a step further. If you don't have peace with God, you won't have peace with yourself. Therefore, you're going to have a flawed view of who you are. Let me put it to you this way. A flawed view of yourself comes from a flawed view of God. So the flawed view of God is because you've created distance from him. Like he didn't move. You moved and you went away from him. You've turned your back. You've moved away from him. He's not that important in your life. So now you're going to have no peace with him because you have moved away. Right? 
And when we move away from God, these false thoughts and teachings about who God is start to creep in. And you'll believe one of these. Let me give you five of them. Number one, you'll believe he's Burger King God. You're away right away at Burger King now, right? Anybody know that commercial? You know what I'm saying? And Burger King God, if you think God is the Burger King God, it's just like, well, if I pray about it or if I want something, God's supposed to do it. He's like a magic genie. I rub the lamp, he comes out, I tell him what I want, and then he does it. And sometimes we do that because maybe you were grown, you grew up in a way where you were given a lot of things, right? And so you project your, your past onto God and say, well, I was given everything when I grew up, so therefore God should give me everything. And then when he doesn't, you go, hey, wait a minute. And so if you have this flawed view of God as Burger King God, what will happen is you think of yourself higher than you should because God should be giving me X, Y, Z. That's called pride. The second thing is no soup for you, God. Seinfeld fans in the room? No soup for you, one year, right? And the no soup for you, God, the no soup, God, is that God says you can't have any fun. All rules. Rules, 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 rules. And if you grew up in an environment like that, where maybe you had your parents or grandparents who ever raised you, and it was all rules all the time, you might think that God's rules all the time. And if I make one wrong move, lightning on my head right there, right? And you're scared to death of God, right? You're scared to death of making a mistake. What about bodyguard God? And I will always love you. Not that bodyguard. But bodyguard God is the God that I think, well, nothing bad's ever going to happen to me. Right? He's my protector, so therefore nothing can happen to me if I just come to church. And that's not biblical. And then something happens and you go, wait a minute. Then goosebump God. Goosebump God is, well, unless something is isn't making me have goosebumps, God's not around. It's, I can only feel God and know God in a church service when the music's playing. Outside of that, I don't, he's nowhere else, right? You grew up in a very super spiritual home. Here's my last one, absentee God. Or maybe you grew up and you had a father that wasn't there or parents that weren't there. And you project that image on God. Maybe you had a, 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 a dad that was there, but he really wasn't involved, right? There's no real relationship. So when we talk about grace and the fact that God wants to have a relationship with you, it's really hard for you to comprehend that, right? And what happens is the farther away you get from God, you start to believe these distorted views of God. And therefore, if you believe those things, you will then act a certain way. It will change your heart in the wrong way. But the flip side is that, of that is when you see God clearly, <clears throat> you will see yourself clearly. When you see God clearly, you will see yourself more clearly. So how do, how do you do that? you got to get close. you got to get close to God. And knowing God is the key to seeing the beauty of your brokenness. So you have to get close to God so then you can actually expose your brokenness to him and then he can show you, yeah, I see that and I love that. See, knowing your God and knowing getting close to him will know your God-given identity will show you the confidence that you need to have, the self-esteem you need to have, the awareness you need to have, the validation that you're seeking, increase your faith, and show you your purpose. Now today, I want to look at a familiar story out of Exodus. Exodus. Now, the word Exodus means exit, and some of you are familiar with Exodus because you've seen a few movies, Right? Anybody seen a movie about the Exodus, right? Ten Commandments, anybody? Hello, is anybody, anybody in here today? But here's what happens. When I say the word Exodus, if you know anything about the Bible or if you've been in church at any time, it doesn't mean, you, I'm not saying you've got to be a, a scholar by any means, but most people, if I bring up the word Exodus, will think about the conflict between God and Pharaoh, right, and the plagues, the frogs, that's gross. Anyways, um, the parting of the Red Sea, the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, or the tabernacle. Most people are going to think of those things that happen in Exodus. But there's something that precedes all of these things. It's extremely important. We can't skip over it. We can't just brush over it. It's when God calls Moses. Now, Moses' life is broken up in three 40-year periods, just so you, should, so you can know. Four, three 40-year periods. The first period, he's living in Egypt. And some of you know, 
He's a Hebrew. But because of situations, I'm not going to tell you all of you, you've got to go read your Bible. Okay, it's Exodus chapter 1. You can go read all that. And he's living in Egypt. The second part, the next 40 years, he's learning in Midian. Right? He has to leave Egypt because he did something pretty bad. He leaves. Go read your Bible. I'm not going to tell you where it's at. Okay? you got to go read it. And then the third one is leading the Israelites in the desert. Okay? Now, I want you to understand this. In the second part, towards the end of the second part, this is where the call of Moses happens. So at the end of the second 40 years, so he's almost 80 years old, and that's when the call from God goes to Moses. So if anybody walked in here today and said, I'm too old for God to call me to do something, you're wrong, right? And on the flip side of that, I'm too young. Well, you're wrong too, okay? But what we find out in this call is that here's how it works. God reveals himself to Moses, and then God commissions Moses, and then Moses argues with him. And some of y'all have already been doing that. God reveals himself to you. You go, oh, wow. I need to follow God. I I need to give my life to Jesus. Then he'll give you a purpose and call you to go do something. You go, well, I don't know about that. Like, I just want to come to church. That's it. Like, I didn't want want to do all that, right? But see, God pursues Moses to reveal himself to Moses. That's the purpose. That's That's why he pursued him. And God pursues you to reveal himself to you. You understand that? God pursued Moses So then Moses would then go introduce God to all the people. You understand that? So God pursues you, so you would introduce God to all the people. Everybody follow me? Right? So no matter what, God's pursuing you, and the purpose is going to be for you to introduce him to the people. So God's call on Moses really isn't about Moses. It's about introducing God to his people. So today in Exodus chapter 3, that's where I'm going to be at. So if you want to get to your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, totally cool. We're going to have one. I got a big Bible on the screen. We're going to follow that one. But I want you to look at four attributes of God that's going to give us a very clear picture of who he is. And if you can understand who he is, you'll know who you are too. Because when you see God clearly, you will see yourself clearly. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 15, where is, it's where I'm going to be at today. Here we go. One day, Moses was tending to the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Now pause, angel of the Lord. I just want to pause here. Who, who is this angel? Is it Gabriel? Is it Michael? Who is this angel? angel? The answer to those first two questions I had is no. It's not either one of those. Why would I say that? Because this angel doesn't just speak for God, but also speaks as God. There's only one other person in the Bible who's both identical in status and distinct in essence from the Lord. And his name is Jesus. This is what we call a theophany. An appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament before the New Testament. How powerful is that? Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. Now, the burning bush, pause. We need to explain this. It's very significant. Don't pass over the burning bush because it's really not explained. It's just like there's a burning bush. Okay, we keep going. Whoa, 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 whoa. There was a bush burning that didn't burn up? I don't know about you, but I have never seen one of those before. So what is this burning bush? The burning bush is a picture of God, a fire who has the power to consume all, yet in its mercy does not. A fire, who's our God, who has the power to consume whatever he wants to consume and destroy it if he even wants to, but in his mercy, he does not. So the fire represents holy judgment, but also purification. A holy judgment and a holy purification. The justice and refining at the same time. If we see this in the pillar of fire, if you guys know your book, your Bible's about the pillar of fire, 
It's supposed to accompany them so they could see where to go. The pillar of fire, it represents the presence of God, his judgment and purification. Mount Sinai, God descended on it like a fire, his presence. The tabernacle, there's always a fire there. The perpetual fire shows his presence of judgment and purification. His presence reminds us, and this fire reminds us that he is in control because it didn't burn the bush up. See, he can burn in you, around you, and through you, but not consume you. Now, the first attribute we see of God is this. Number one, he's holy. He's holy. He's holy. Verse three, this is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. Now, question, why is this ground holy? Is it because it's got a specific, this specific dirt is special or it's in a geographical location that is holy? The answer is no, it is not. In fact, the tabernacle, if you guys know, it moved. It would move and then stop. They would, they would move, and then God would stop right there. In fact, the first temple that Solomon built, and then the second temple, Zerubbabel built, it was on a completely different mountain range than this. So is this ground where they're standing actually holy ground? No. It's not the place that's holy. It's the presence that makes it holy. It's not the location that makes it holy. It's the Lord that makes it holy. It's not the materials of the tabernacle that are holy. Is that the materials in the temple that are holy? Is that the materials that you own that are holy? Oh, it's only because God is in you that makes anything that you touch holy. It's him in us. God now dwells in us. So why does, why does God tell Moses to take off his sandals? I hope you understand that Moses would have known this cultural norm. You're supposed to take off your shoes in the presence of a king. And Moses would have, when he was in Egypt, been around a king and understood all of this. But now he's in the presence of one that's the king of kings. So look at the next verse. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. This is number two. Not only is he holy, he's personal. He's personal. This is the God who spoke the world into existence. I want you to know this. If you're a Christian, your greatest asset in life is the voice of God. If you're a follower of Jesus, the greatest asset you have is the voice of God. Let me remind you that God is still speaking. God is not dead. He speaks to us primarily through Scripture. That's why you got to get in the Word. People all say, I want God to speak to me. Are you reading your Bible? Oh, no, no, I don't really know where to start at. Well, you're not going to hear from him unless you get into the Word. you got to get into the Word. He speaks to us through Scripture, through promptings, nudges, visions, dreams, and many other ways. I just want you to know this. Man cannot live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And Jesus, Jesus is the Word. And we see in here, Moses hides his face. You know why Moses hid his face in this situation? I'll tell you why. Because he already heard the stories about God. He already heard the stories about him. He heard about what he's done in the past. And he's sitting here going, whoa, this is the God talking to me, and he knows my name. Somebody in here needs to know this. God knows you, and he knows your name, and he wants to speak to you. He knows you, and in spite of your brokenness, he loves you and forgives you if you put your faith in Jesus, and he wants to speak to you. Do you want him to speak to you? He is a personal God. He, yes, he is holy, but yet he is personal at the same time. The third thing 
Not only is he holy and he's personal, he's compassionate. He's compassionate. What does that mean? He cares and he acts when his children are in need. Just like I do with my children. I love them very, very much. I care about them and I will act. Compassion has an action to it. So God cares about you. He loves you. And he will act on your behalf. Check this out. Exodus, again, we're going to verse uh, 7 through through, uh, 9 here. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression. I have certainly seen seen the oppression. I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard, I have heard, I saw it and I heard the cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware. Notice what he said. I have seen, I have heard, and I'm aware. I have seen, I have heard, I am aware of what's going on with my children. So two things we can derive from that. God is not surprised. God knows what's going on in your life. He is not an absentee God who's far away. Yes, he is holy, but he's personal and he's compassionate. Therefore, listen, he's not surprised, but he's going to do it in his timing, okay? He's not surprised, But you have to trust to know that behind the scenes there's stuff happening that you don't see him doing. He's always moving. So I have come down. I have come down. Come down. I saw. I heard. I'm aware. But now I have come down. Because the timing is right, right now. I have come down to do what? Rescue. Rescue. Them, the people, from the power of the Egyptians and lead them to rescue them and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and maybe Cellulites. I don't know. They all live right there. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe not. Here's my point. Here's my point. God has prepared the people, and he has prepared the place. They just didn't know it yet. God is always preparing you, and he's always preparing the place at the same time, if you trust him. Simultaneously, he is preparing you and preparing the place he wants to take you, if you'll trust him. When you create distance, you're telling him, God, I don't trust you. If you get close to him, he goes, okay, now here's what we're going to do. Behind the scenes, I'm going to be working in your heart, getting you ready. And I got this place I'm trying to take you to. You're going to have to trust me. It might zigzag this way and left and right. You might want to make a straight line, but I'm not doing a straight line because I need certain things to happen. I need you to walk a certain way. I need you to learn some things before I get to B. So you got to trust me as we walk from A to B. I'm going to rescue them and lead them. What is that? What is, what is God doing? Why is he saying he's going to rescue and lead? He's, he's letting Moses know, I'm fulfilling a promise that Moses would have known about. The promise was, was for who? Abraham. Abraham. So God knows the place where he needs to take the people. He already knew this. He made the promise. Stop doubting God like he doesn't know where you need to go. He knows exactly where you need to go. And if he spoke it to you a year ago or five years ago or five months ago, he is taking you there. You have to trust him. He's preparing the people. He's preparing you. And he will deliver you when the time is right. Listen, it didn't make any sense for all of that land for God to just give it to Abraham and his few people at the time. It didn't make any sense for him just to give it to Isaac and his few people. Even Jacob. But now, now in the story, hundreds of years later, God has preserved a people who are now a nation. Millions of people. The Egyptians are so scared of them because they're so numerous that they're starting to kill them. So God, it totally makes sense. God says, oh, I'm going to move you to a spacious land, right? Because now you're ready for the promise. To be fulfilled. So some of you today, 
you have outgrown your Egypt that you're in, and it's time for you to move out. God is calling you out of your Egypt. Some of you today have gotten so familiar with your Egypt, it's become very comfortable in your Egypt. You have become enslaved to your pride, possibly, or an addiction that you have of something. And it's been very comfortable in Egypt. God is calling you out now. He says, I'm going to rescue you and lead you into this land that I've prepared for you. I don't know if you noticed what kind of land was it? Was it dry and nasty old land, right? With gravel on it, with you can't even grow any crops. Like, no, 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 no. Milk and honey. I like both of those. Like, give me some milk and give me some honey. Like, I'm, I'm great. Like, this is fantastic. Milkshakes with a little honey on top. Come on, somebody. Like, the, this is the greatest thing that's happened. And see, some of you today, you are not experiencing the promised land and the milk and honey that God has for you because you are so married to your Egypt. Will you step out of it today? And some of you, the reason why you won't step out of it today because you have a false understanding of who God is. You don't trust that he actually has a promised land for you, right? Because you don't see him as a good father. Check this out. Look. The cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. So God says, I've seen all this, now I'm going to do something about it. Now Moses is probably getting excited right now, like, hey, this is great. God's going to do something about this. God's going to help us. He's going to rescue us and bless us. Hallelujah. Rescue us, Lord, come on and give me some blessing. Woo! Revival! But then read verse 10. Now go! No, wait a minute. No, no, God, you're going to go. No, you, you go. No, 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 no. I'm not going anywhere. You're going to lead me, but no, I don't want you to lead me like that. Now go! For I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people. I thought you were going to lead the people. No, no. You are going to lead the people out of Egypt. Moses did not, ex not, did not expect him to say this. Here's your warning on this. Be careful what selfish expectations you put on a compassionate God. Be careful the expectations you put on a God who's very compassionate about his children. Because God will call you to do something that you don't want to do and you don't feel equipped to do. Why? Because he loves his children. And he doesn't want any of them to perish. He wants a relationship with all of his children. Not just some of them. All of them. So be careful. The expectation you put on a God who's crazy about his children. Because he'll do anything to get to his children. Here's the next thing I want to say to you. God taps Moses on the shoulder. And says, you're going to be the messenger. You're going to go and do this. Now, we see a lot of times in the Old Testament, God brings a prophet, who's a messenger, to the people. And they say, hey, stop doing this or else. Now, how many times do you think they actually listen? More often than not, they do not listen. Now, before you get on your high horse and go, gosh, those just terrible heathens, like I cannot believe them. We do the same thing, don't we? Do we not, right? Get into the, if you get into the word and you don't get convicted, you're not reading it, okay? You're just, you're just skimming it. You're trying to find a verse to make you feel good about yourself, right? When you get into the word, it should convict you to change. I got to change something. I got to surrender something that's in my heart, right? So God will send a messenger, and we have the Holy Spirit now, by the way, to get attention and to lead to blessing, so not only will the Holy Spirit come to convict you, but the Holy Spirit will then lead you into the blessing. The problem is this. People don't listen, and sometimes the messengers don't want to go. Right? Do you know that? So if God calls you to be a messenger, get ready, because some people just won't listen. They won't. But you still got to go. You can't let your fear of what you're going to face stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Right? 
verse 11. But Moses protested, oh, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Now, don't be too harsh on Moses here. We've got a, bur- a bush that's burning and an angel talking to him, okay? This is kind of odd. The real issue is this. The first 40 years of Moses' life, he actually wanted to deliver the people out of their slavery. He wanted to do that. Yet every time he tried, it backfired on him. Now he's been in the, world, the wilderness for another 40 years. He's 80 years old. He doesn't have the strength he once had. He doesn't have the popularity he once had. He doesn't have the position he once had. He doesn't have the army he once had. He doesn't have the weapons. They're all gone. And then God says, now you need to go. What? Why didn't you call me 50 years ago? I had all these resources. Now, if you read that verse 11 again, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? It's not so much fear as it is logic. Like, whoa. Like, I don't got anything to offer God. I'm 80 years old. I don't have any money. I don't got an army. I got nothing. Who am I? And God's answer is nobody. You are nobody. And that's why you qualify for this job. I hope you know this. It took 40 years for God to take somebody who was a somebody and make him a nobody, right? 40 years ago, Moses might have asked a little different. Oh, you want me to go to see Pharaoh? I'll go see Pharaoh right now. Bring it on. Come on, Cletus. Like, come on. Come on. You walk over. You're limping back. Like, I mean, come on, right? This is an 80-year-old man who's been tending sheep for 40 years, he probably doesn't even know where he's got any weapons at, period. He probably hasn't touched a weapon in 40 years. <laughs> the right question is, who am I? That's the right question. The fact of the matter is this. Moses is not the deliverer. God is the deliverer. And oftentimes, you will not move forward because you think the result depends solely on you. So you'll feel overwhelmed if you think it all depends on you and you won't move. Let me ask you this question. Why did God choose Moses in this phase of his life? Why? Why? So there would be no doubt that it was God who delivered the people into the promised land. No doubt. And some of you today, why would God use me? Why would God, why would God want to use me? I'm just this or I'm not that. You fill in the blank with I'm, I'm this and that, all these negative things. So there would be no doubt that when God moved, it wasn't you. It was him. Verse 12. God answered, I will be with you and this is your sign. Now, I don't know about you. If I was Moses, I'd be like, yeah, God, can you give me a sign that this is going to work out? because I'm scared to death. I don't really want to go talk to Pharaoh. What is the sign that you'll give me? God, give me, I will be with you. Uh, well, that's not really a sign per se. Like I just thought you'd show me something that was like for sure, for sure it's going to work out, you know, before I go do that. No, I'm just going to be with you. I just, just trust me, I'll be with you. Check this out. I'll be with you, and this is your sign that I'm the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Now, Paul, that's your sign. That's your sign. What, what, what? No, no, I don't think you got it. I don't think y'all got it. I don't think, because everybody said we're quiet. You didn't get it. I, I'd like to have a sign, God. Okay, when you bring them out, like past, like it's already happened, like when that happens, you will then worship me. That's your sign. Amen. What, 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 am I saying? what am I saying? The sign is the victory he hasn't seen yet. So there's going to be a victory. It's going to happen. It ain't happened yet. You haven't even left yet. Okay. But when the victory is over, that I'm telling you is going to happen, then you're going to worship me. And when you're standing there worshiping, after the victory's happened, you're going to go, wow, I remember he told me this was going to happen. Right? My question to you today is, do you have that kind of faith? When God says obey, 
Do you say, I want to know. Obey, I want to know. Obey, I want to know. Obey. God says, you will know because I do what I said I was going to do. And I'll be with you. So if I'm with you, you don't need to know how I'm going to do it. Which brings me to my fourth point and last point. He's sufficient. He's sufficient. But Moses, again, if I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they're going to ask, what's his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all the generations. Know this, God has already identified himself earlier in verse 6. Moses went in awe. He was like, whoa, this is him. I got to take the sandals off. Like, this is God right here. And God calls him to do it. And God's like, Moses is like, I don't know if I want to do that. And God's letting Moses know this. Yes, you are incapable. You are very much incomplete. And you're very much insufficient. But I am not. No, you can't do this by yourself. You can't. But I can. That's why I'm going to be with you. What's God saying? He's saying, I am, not I was. Right? I am now going to be with you. Not even so much that I'll be at some time in the future, but I am with you right now. He is I am now. And you might say, well, I am what? I am what, Pastor Justin? May fill the blank in. Why don't God just fill in the blank? I am what? What is he? I don't understand. Why didn't he fill the blank in? Because there's not enough words to fill in the blank. He's faithful. He's forgiving. He's glorious. He's a refuge. He's an ever-present help in our time of need. He's a good father. He is love. He is peace. He is just. He is mighty. He is powerful. He's our helper. He's our maker. He's our provider. He's our advocate. He's the most high God. He's our comforter. He's a mighty rock. He is wise. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's eternal. He's compassionate. He's the only true God. He's righteous. And let me just say, he is indescribable. Listen, and none of those scratch the surface. He is, I am, and that is all we need because he's sufficient. And that great I am, if he is in you and you put your faith in him, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, did you not know yourself? That Christ Jesus is in you? Some of you walk around here today like you don't know that the great I am is dwelling in you. And he says, go. You go. You go to Pharaoh. Go. I'll be with you. But what? I don't need to know. No, no, you don't need to know. All you need to know is I'm sufficient. That's all you need to know. See, if you're in Christ... And Christ is in you. Listen to this. Stop insulting the creator by, dis- by degrading his creation. Stop it. And stop believing lies. A lie believed as truth will affect you as if it were true. And the lie is this. That your worth is based on what people say about you and your past experiences. That's the lie. That's not where we get our worth from. Not from your past experiences and not from what other people say about you. Oh, I'm a loser. I'm a bum. I'm stupid. I'm an idiot. I'm dumb. I'm worthless. I'm talentless. I'm a failure. God says, I'm not. Don't call me that. See, if you're in Christ, he knows you and still loves you and has a plan and a purpose and a direction and wants to guide you. God determines who we are. Don't give that authority to someone lesser than God. Don't give that authority to something lesser than God. God says that you are, number one, called by Christ. 
1 Peter 2, 9, for you are a chosen people. You're a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful lights. 1 Peter 5, 10, in his kindness, God called you into eternal glory by means of Jesus. What's that mean? You have a hope. He's called you to have a hope. You don't have to walk around here with your head down like this life is it. No, there is more beyond this. He has called you. He has called you. He has called you. Number two, you are capable through Christ. Not just called by Christ. You're capable, capable, capable. When God calls you, he calls you with the capability to do what he's called you to do. Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. What does that mean? It's because of his strength through me. That's how I'm capable to do it. Not because of my strength, because of his strength. Romans 8, 37. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. We're capable because he qualifies us. And the third thing, you're complete in Christ. Second, Second Peter chapter 1. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him here in your heart. Gnosko. To know him on an intimate level. Have a relationship with him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Colossians chapter 2. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you are also complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. In closing, I want you to understand this. You're called. You're capable and you're complete because God is holy. He is personal. He's compassionate and he is sufficient.